Good evening, Calvary Chapel West Grove. How are everybody doing? Let's try that again. How's everybody doing? Tonight, as you guys know, is a very special service. We're so excited to see each and every single one of you. Every service is special when we get to gather together to worship the Lord and to get into his word, to draw near to him, knowing that he will draw near to us. But tonight, we're just so, so, so excited that you are here. We're going to be in store and a treat to see what the Lord is going to do tonight as we glorify him. Amen. So let's stand and let's begin our service with a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we come and we're just so excited to be here. God, for some of us, it was difficult, bad weeks, busyness, just all these different things weighing on our mind and in our heart. And we lay those things aside now. We fix our eyes upon you. And some of us just came into this place leaping, rejoicing, overwhelmed with your goodness. No matter what we walked in here with, Lord, all of our hearts are the same, just to adore you, to worship you, and to glorify you. And we pray as we do that, that you would come. We invite your presence. This time is nothing without you, and it's all about you. And so, Jesus, send your Holy Spirit in this place to do an amazing work in the hearts and lives of your people as we worship you, Lord. We pray that tonight, as each and every single one of us gets in our car and we drive away from this place, we would be nothing more than in awe of you. And so be here with us now. We lift all these things up in Jesus' name. We all say, amen. Let's worship. There was a moment where the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history cross made for sinners for every curse is blood atoned one final breath and it was finished but not the end we could have known for the earth began to sing i 
we just sang who you are to us Lord that you are our safe place Lord you are our maker Lord you are the the author and finisher of our faith Lord we are declaring that as who you are Lord you are so worthy of your beautiful name Jesus Lord I just ask now that that we would enter into this time Lord and, and not just tonight Lord but Every single time that we try to be in your presence, that we, we set, aside, set aside time to be with you, Lord, that we would truly just be so in awe, we're so amazed, and we would just be there in just such reverence, Lord, for you, because you are worthy. Lord, how thankful we are to be able to to receive that beautiful gift of salvation, Lord, that you offer through your son, Jesus Christ. How undeserving we are of that, Lord. But we are so thankful for that grace, Lord, that you give us. Lord, I just ask now over tonight, Lord, that your spirit would move, Lord, that as we observe, Lord, what, it, what a Passover is, Lord, what it is to honor, Lord, I pray that you would, Lord, speak to us, minister to us, Lord. Lord, that we would be able to, to get just a side glimpse of, of what it is, Lord, that really happens, Lord, that what, what happens, Lord, 
when you sent Jesus, Lord, to die for us. Lord, may we be so, again, just in awe. Lord, may we thank you. Every single moment of our lives, may it, may it be a reflection of that gift, Lord, of that grace that you have given us. Lord, may you empower us to live for you. Lord, so we thank you for this time of worship, Lord, and, and we just look forward with so much anticipation as we enter into this Easter season, Lord, and as we come close to Palm Sunday, Lord, may we just, Lord, be so excited, Lord, knowing full well, Lord, that you came, Lord, and yes, you died, Lord, but you rose again, Lord, giving us that eternal hope and that victory in you. Lord, so go before us now. We give you this time. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say amen. Amen, amen. Yes, give the Lord a hand. Oh, it's so sweet to see you guys here this evening. Uh, Wednesday nights are always a special time to get together midweek, get back into God's Word, get back into fellowship, get back into a time of corporate worship. No matter what's happened, uh, you know, after Sunday service, we can come back and meet together and get built back up. So always a blessing to be with you guys on Wednesday night. Um, as you typically know, we have our connection cards. Any new visitors here tonight? Anybody just visiting for the first time? If, all right. Welcome. Thank you. Awesome. Hopefully somebody said hello to you, but you just got a whole church welcome, big hug to you. So, But welcome to our, our, our Wednesday night uh, fellowship here at Calvary Chapel West Grove. We want to welcome those who might be joining us online as well. Uh, welcome to our, our main sanctuary here. But we have our connection cards in the chair pouch in front of you, and you can use those for a couple different things. One, prayer needs, uh, questions about discipleship, if, if you want to get involved with ministry, more info about the church, uh, baptisms, those types of things. Please fill that out. Drop it in the wooden agape box on the way out, and we'd be happy to get back with you and, and connect with you. So we, we want you to be a vital part of this community here at Calvary Chapel West Grove, get part of the body and get invested. And so please use those connection cards and we will make good on that offer. Um, coming up, our, our Holy Week, uh, th there's nothing more exciting for me than going into Resurrection Sunday. So obviously we're, we're kicking it off a little early with our Seder service, more on that here in a moment. But we're gonna have our Palm Sunday service uh, this Sunday and then Good Friday on the 15th. That will be a 12 p.m. service right here in the main sanctuary. Hopefully you can make it and join us. Not sure what your work schedule is, but maybe you can take a half day and come on over or get off an extended lunch. And then we're going to have our sunrise service right here in our south parking lot. We're going to transform the south parking lot into a little stage area and, and we'll set out some chairs. But if you have a more comfortable chair you'd like to bring, please feel free. We won't have our feelings hurt. Bring your chairs on out and we're just going to uh, worship the Lord as the sun rises, get into a time of worship and his word for Easter sunrise service. And then, of course, our main sanctuary service is here at 9 and 11 a.m. But something really special. Um, if you haven't been baptized or you'd like to be baptized, we're going to offer baptisms on Easter Sunday. And so um, more on that. If you get our weekly newsletter, you can sign up through the weekly newsletter. There's a link there. If you're a social media consumer and, and you follow us on social media, we have a link in our bio. You can also do that. If you don't do any of those things, you can fill out the connection card, drop it in the agape box, and we will reach out to you and, and we'll connect with you that way and get you on the list. So we just want to make sure we have enough t-shirts. Yes, you get a, a really cool t-shirt uh, for, for baptism on Sunday, but may that not be your motivation. That's just an ancillary benefit, right? It's an outward expression of what's happened inwardly, what Christ has done in your heart. And so if you want to express that outwardly and you haven't done that yet, we encourage you to do so this Sunday, and, and uh, we'll get more information to you on that. Uh, Christian Legal Aid work is going to be here this Saturday, the 9th, in the Fellowship Hall. I believe it's going to be from 830 to 1230. So if you have any questions about legal matters in your life, uh, sometimes those can be daunting. They can be overwhelming. You might not know where to go. You can get some great guidance. So if you have documentation or paperwork that would be relevant to your situation, bring it with you, and, and, and they'll sit down with you and confidentially go through your matter and hopefully give you really good guidance on what to do next and where to go. So Christian Legal Aid from 12, 830 to 1230 here in our fellowship hall coming up this Saturday. So we encourage you to go. And by the way, it's free, free of charge. Um, family Skate Night is also coming up. So Monday, the 25th, 6 to 8 p.m. at the Fountain Valley Skate Center. So families, uh, anybody, single guys, you can come skating, I guess, too. But come on out. Uh, we're going to uh, have a family skate night. It'll be from 6 to 8 p.m. Fountain Valley Skate Center. Um, I think it's $8 per skater or free if you just want to go and hang out and be with everybody. Uh, I never learned how to roller skate, so I'm going to probably 
You probably won't see me there Monday night, but uh, <laughs> come on out. Don't make that your reason not to go. Um, real, real quick, obviously we have something a little different here tonight. Uh, usually we go through our, our Monday, uh, Wednesday night Bible study, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We're taking a break from that tonight, and we just have a really special brother from an organization called Jews for Jesus. His name is Isaac Brickner, and we're going to bring him up here in a moment to lead us through a Seder, a, a, a Seder service. So it's Christ in the Passover, and I wanted to share a scripture with you really quick. If you brought your Bibles, you can open up to 1 Corinthians 5. If you don't, I'm going to read it for you. Oh. That's his thank you card, I think. All right, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, Paul says something really, really interesting. Now, remember, the church in Corinth is a Gentile church. It's a, it's a, it's a fledgling church. It's only a couple years old. And Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, says this, Your boasting is not good. Do you, know, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may not be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. And then he says this, For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now think about this for a minute. This is a Gentile church couple years old. This is a very Jewish thing to say to a Gentile church. You would, be, you would think he's talking to the church in Jerusalem, but he's talking to the church in Corinth. So how would they know these references? How would they even understand what Paul is talking about? How would they comprehend that Christ is our Passover? And it's because when he spent those 18 months with them founding the church and leading them through the scriptures after preaching the gospel, he was leading them through the Old Testament scriptures where Christ is depicted time and time and time again, picture after picture, illustration after illustration. But it's concealed in the Old Testament and it's revealed in the New Testament what we have today. First Corinthians wasn't part of the New Testament. The New Testament didn't exist at the time that when Paul was writing it. It wasn't part of the canon. All they had was the Old Testament scriptures, the prophecies, the law. And so he took them through those scriptures 19 times in 1 Corinthians. He refers back to the Old Testament. And so time and time again, we see Christ depicted in the Old Testament and revealed in the New Testament. So hopefully tonight, that revelation will come afresh and anew for you as we go through this Seder service. So would you welcome up Isaac Brickner from Jews for Jesus. Give him a warm welcome from West Grove. Oh, you got that. All right. Thanks so much, Pastor Chris, Pastor Eric. Shalom. All right, you're going to have to do better than that, guys. I'm sorry. Shalom. Shalom. That's what I'm talking about. Now I feel right at home. My name is Isaac Brickner. I'm the Los Angeles branch leader of Jews for Jesus. I'm so delighted to be with you this evening. We are going to look at something that's so important, not only, as Pastor Chris mentioned, to Jewish people, but to the life of faith for all of those who follow Jesus. We are going to look at Christ in the Passover, okay? So I work with an organization called Jews for Jesus. And when I introduce myself to people for the first time, people look at me like some of you are looking at me right now because they think I said something like vegans for bacon or something like that, right? Jewish, Jesus, it doesn't really usually go in the same sentence. And for most of you sitting here to this evening, I'm willing to bet that most of you know better than to think that, right? Because Jesus is Jewish. Notice I said is, not was. All of his disciples, Peter, James, John, you name it, these were Jewish guys. And we know that all of the writers of the New Testament, with the possible exception of Luke, were also Jewish. And we know that Luke was a doctor, so who knows? Maybe he was Jewish too. How many of you know, how many of you have a Jewish doctor, right? There are a lot of Jewish doctors, and when you're growing up in a Jewish home, there are really only three available jobs for you, and that is doctor, lawyer, or failure. So uh, you can see where I ended up on that list, but the fact of the matter is, believing in Jesus in the first century was a very Jewish thing to do. Okay, so when the first Gentile or non-Jewish person wanted to believe in the Messiah of Israel, oy, <laughs> we had some problems, okay? But don't take my word for it. If you need a refresher, go back after this and read from the book of Acts chapter 10, 
when Paul, or rather God, had to give the apostle Peter three visions before he finally got up the chutzpah, or the nerve, as we say, to go and see this Gentile man named Cornelius who had had a vision of Jesus and tell him the good news. And there was so much commotion, so much uproar about this in the early church that we had to hold the first church council in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 15, the subject of the first church council in Jerusalem was what are we going to do with all these Gentiles for Jesus? But we found out it was a good thing, right? It was all part of God's plan from before the foundation of the world that all nations, every tribe and tongue would come to worship the God of Israel through the Messiah of Israel, and that is Jesus. Amen? So, this evening we are going to look at the common thread that weaves through the tapestry of God's redemptive plan. And that common thread is the celebration of the Passover. I love how Pastor Chris set that up. Why should you as Gentiles care about the Passover? Because it's the foundation of everything that we profess to believe as followers of Jesus. Now, for some Jewish people, if you said that you were celebrating Passover in church, they would look at you and say, well, isn't that just cultural appropriation? Okay, well, maybe some of you think that. And and let me be real with you for a second. There are Christian brothers and sisters who take liking Jewish stuff a little too far, okay? Maybe some of you know them. Maybe some of them are sitting with you in this room. That's, that's okay, okay? Just know that there's nothing like secret about what we're discussing here today. There's nothing that's like the secret sauce of your faith within Jewish stuff. But what we're looking at tonight is the most foundational truth that God has woven into his plan of redemption. So if Jesus is not the Messiah of Israel, he's nobody's Messiah, Okay, And if Jesus is not the Messiah of Israel, then not only is Passover celebrating cultural appropriation, but all of the New Testament is cultural appropriation. Think about that. But Jesus is the Messiah of Israel and for the rest of the world. He is the Savior of the world. And I hope that you will see by the end of our time together that this is more than just some Jewish ritual, but that it is an object lesson of the life and the mission of Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen? So look closely at all the stuff we're going to talk about together. I think you'll see a picture of Jesus in his life, his death, his resurrection, and in the promise of his return. So we're going to set the scene for our celebration of the Passover this evening with Jesus and his disciples at the Last Supper in the upper room, which was a Passover Seder. Okay? Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 7. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. It's also going to be on the screen. Jesus is getting ready for the Passover. Verse 7 says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and they found it just as he had told them and they prepared it the Passover. So Jesus sends Peter and John on this super secret mission to find this room that's already prepared for Passover. But Passover involves a lot of preparation. The first night of Passover actually begins a seven-day holiday on the Jewish calendar known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And during that time in Jewish homes, we don't eat anything that contains leaven or yeast. And this is because throughout Scripture, Leaven is frequently referred to as a symbol of sin. The passage Pastor Chris just read for us says, the leaven leavens the whole lump, right? So during this time of Passover, 
we get rid of all of the leaven as a way of saying we want to break the cycle of sin in our lives. Those of you who have made a loaf of bread before, you know that it only takes a little bit of leaven for the dough to rise and become what? Puffed up. In the same way that sin causes us to become puffed up in our own eyes. So that means that in more religious, more traditional, orthodox Jewish homes, for up to six weeks prior to the Passover, the house is going through a complete spring cleaning. And we're removing all of this stuff from the house, all of the leaven. So that means anything delicious you can imagine, right? Cake, cookies, Hostess Twinkies, which you probably shouldn't be eating anyway, but I'm not going to judge you if you do. Anyway, all that stuff has to go, okay? And in more traditional, more religious, more, more orthodox Jewish homes, this is usually the work of the woman of the house. This is mom's job. And she's removing all of the leaven from the home for these six weeks. But if you noticed, it says that Jesus sent two men, Peter and John, to prepare for the Passover. Because in Jewish tradition, it's the man that represents his family before God, kind of like a priest, okay? But there's a very special, we'll say, tradition that gets the head of the household out of this predicament, okay? And that tradition is called bedikat chametz, okay? Bedikat chametz. I'm not going to ask you to say that with me. Bedikat chametz means a search for leaven, okay? So you have to imagine this scene. The night before Passover, the head of the household comes home and the house is spotless because his wife has done such a good job cleaning and removing all of the leaven from the home except for some crumbs. And she's taken the crumbs and she's hidden them somewhere in the house and it's up to the man to find these crumbs, okay? So he takes up some interesting looking cleaning devices including a napkin, a wooden spoon, and a feather. Okay, and he goes on this bedikat chametz, the search for leaven. Those crumbs could be anywhere in the house. They could be up in the attic, down in the basement, whatever. But if his wife has been good to him, she hid them exactly where she did the year before that, <laughs> all right? And the year before that, and so on and so forth. And so he finally finds these crumbs, and he'll sweep them into the wooden spoon with the feather without touching them, right? Because they represent what? Sin, right? So he wraps them in a napkin, and he'll take it down to a bonfire in the courtyard of the local synagogue where all of the other men have gathered, and each one will throw his bundle of sin into the flames. Then this guy, the head of the household, returns home and proudly proclaims, now I have purged my house of all leaven. And his wife is standing there going, sure you did, buddy. (laughs) Sure you did. But In either case, it's the head of the household that stands before God, kind of like a priest, to represent his family and leads his family through what is known as the Passover Seder. Some of you probably know that word. Seder is a Hebrew word that means order because the Passover follows a very ancient traditional order of service and that order is recorded for us in a book called the Haggadah. Haggadah means the telling, because it tells the story of Passover. And we don't have a Haggadah for everyone here tonight, but if you noticed on the table out in the foyer, you should have received one of these pamphlets when you walked in. If you don't, don't worry about it. There's going to be some stuff on the screen as well. This is going to kind of act as our Haggadah for us to follow along for this evening, but this is for you to take, and if you don't have one, you can grab one on your way out to remember our time together. But when everything for the Passover has been set up and it's been appropriately prepared, you're supposed to open your front door and announce to the neighborhood and say, let all who are hungry come and eat. And don't get too excited. We're not going to really have a great meal after this. So I hope you kind of ate beforehand or you have some plans for Chick-fil-A afterwards or whatever. But we are going to celebrate the Passover together. And Passover begins, as many Jewish holidays do, with the lighting of candles. And this is usually the duty and honor of the woman of the house. Thanks, Pastor Eric. Not Pastor Eric. (laughs) The woman of my house, uh, her name is Shana. I'll tell you more about my family in a little bit. 
She couldn't be here with us tonight. She's with our three kids back up on the west side of the Los Angeles. She said it was okay if I do it for you, though, okay? I hope that's all right with you. Okay, so the blessing over the candles, I will say it in Hebrew, and then it'll be on the screen, and hopefully we'll be able to go through it together in English. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kedshu Amen. Together. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us by his commandments and commands us to kindle the festival lights. Amen. Very nice. Thanks very much. So Passover is not just any old meal or service. It is the most elaborate feast on the Jewish calendar. And while any old meal or service might just take an hour or two, Passover can take up to a total of four hours. So I hope you cleared your schedules for this evening. Just kidding, I saw a lot of wide eyes when I said that. Don't worry, we'll get you out of here a lot sooner than that. But During that time, each adult will drink from their cup and refill it a total of four times. And each cup has a different name. The first one is called the Kiddush cup, or the cup of sanctification. Then comes the cup of plagues. And the third cup is called Kotzka the cup of redemption. This is the climax. It's the focal point of the Passover. And then lastly is the cup of Hallel, or praise. But with the first cup, the head of the household will offer a blessing to sanctify or set apart the rest of the Seder to follow. So we'll hold up the cup and recite this blessing. I'll say it in Hebrew and then we'll say it together in English. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam borei peri hagafen. Amen. Should be on the screen on the next slide. Yeah, here we go. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Amen. So now the Seder has been sanctified. It's been set apart as holy. And the tradition is now for the youngest person sitting at the table to come forward to the leader of the Passover, the head of the house, and ask traditionally four questions which are found in the Haggadah. They're also in your handout. They're going to be on the screen as well. And they're usually chanted in Hebrew. I'll do the first one for you. It goes like this. You can all tell I had to be that kid before, right? (laughs) Even though I have a younger sister who traditionally is supposed to do it, she got out of it every year. I don't know how she did it. She's like a lot smarter than me, but it's kind of nerve-wracking, right? Stand up in front of your whole family, extended family, to say these things in Hebrew that you just 24 hours ago, right? But let's read that question together in English, shall we? Why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat leavened or unleavened bread. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? Now, let's answer the first part of that question first. Why is this night different from all other nights? If the kid was really being honest in how they asked the questions, it would probably sound something more like, why are we doing this again? (laughs) Some of you kids are probably wondering that right now. Why is there all this food on the table and we're not eating it yet? Why am I dressed like this? What are all these people doing here? These were my questions at Passover growing up, right? But... If you remember from the book of Exodus and later in Deuteronomy, that's actually the whole point of Passover. God says that when your children ask you, what is the meaning of all this stuff that we're doing? You tell them the story of Passover. And that is what we do in response to the child's question. Those of us who sit sit at the table knowing the story of Passover respond and say, this is because of what the Lord did for me when he brought me out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Redemption is the heart of Passover. And it tells us more than just about the message of God's redemption, it also tells us the method 
of God's redemption. And that was the blood of the Passover lamb, right? My ancestors, the Israelites in Egypt, were instructed by God through Moses to take a spotless lamb, to roast it whole without breaking any of its bones, and then apply the blood of this lamb to the doorposts of their homes in Egypt, to the top and the two side posts. And because of their faith in God and in the effectiveness of this provision of the lamb, they were spared the wrath of that tenth plague that fell on the land of Egypt, the death of the firstborn. When God saw the blood upon their door, death was forced to pass over, right? That's where we get the name. In Hebrew, it's Pesach. Can we try that one together? Pesach. All right, you got a little practice there. <laughs> We'll keep trying, okay? Don't look at the person next to you when you say that, all right? Just trying to keep you comfortable there. Pesach is the holiday that commemorates the time that death itself passed over the houses of Israel in the land of Egypt. Why? Because of the blood of the lamb. Was it because of the Israelites? Was it because they were God's chosen people? Was it because they did anything right or moral? No, it was only those who had applied the blood of the lamb to their doorposts. And it is a picture for us of an even greater act of redemption through the blood of another Passover lamb, right? Messiah Jesus, just as none of the bones of that first Passover lamb were to be broken, the apostle John tells us that none of Jesus' bones were broken in his death. And just as my ancestors had to apply that blood to their doorposts in faith, each one of us sitting here tonight must apply the blood of Messiah to the doorposts of our hearts. Amen? You might say, well, maybe I'm, I'm a good person. Maybe that's enough. No. Only those who have the blood apply to the doorposts of their hearts. All right? And that's how we tell the story of Passover in my home. That's not how you're going to hear it in other Jewish homes okay, Jewish people who have not received Jesus as the Messiah, the first Jewish person to profess faith in Jesus in my family was my great-great-grandmother back in Zhitomer, Ukraine, okay? So I never had to wrestle with all of these cultural questions that many Jewish people do. You can't be Jewish and believe in Jesus, right? My first person who did that was generations ago. So praise God, I grew up in a family of Jewish people following Jesus as the Messiah. All right, I'll tell you more about that later. But we asked two parts in that first question. The first was, why is this night different from all of the nights? The second part was, why are we only eating unleavened bread or matzah? Okay, so one of the items on the Passover table is called the matzah tash. Okay, and it's a pouch that contains three layers of unleavened bread, matzah, separated by some cloth. And at this point, the head of the household will remove the middle of the three layers of matzah, and he'll hold it up, and he'll say, this is the bread of affliction which our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. Now, it's not called the bread of affliction because it's disgusting, okay? It's actually pretty good. But after like seven days of eating nothing but do anything to get a slice of pizza, trust me. But the bread of affliction, which our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt, it's called that because we had to take our bread with us while it was still flat. It had no time to rise in our haste to leave Egypt. So the head of the household will perform what's called the yachatz, the breaking of the middle matzah. He'll hold it up and recite this blessing. It should be on the screen. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Together. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. So then we'll break it in two. One half gets set aside, and the other half gets a new name, which is Afikomen. Can we say that together? Afikomen. Good. Now, that is actually not a Hebrew word. It's Greek, which should tell you about the time period that it came from. And it means that which comes later, or he who comes later. So what happens with the Afikomen now is it is wrapped in a linen cloth and hidden from everyone at the table, or buried, if you will. 
And no one is supposed to know where the afikoman is hidden because later all of the kids go looking for it. And whoever finds it gets a prize. All right, I saw some of the kids just like perk up when I said that. Okay, if there's anyone here, let's say under the age of 13, okay? Not anyone who feels like they're under 13, okay? <laughs> anyone under the age of 13, if you want to participate in this, well, all you have to do right now is close your eyes, okay? Close your eyes, no peeking. I'll know if you peeked. I'll know, okay? Let's see what we can do here. <laughs> All right, you can open your eyes. Okay, later on, if you didn't peek, I'm going to ask you to get up and go find the afikoman, okay? I'll know if you peeked. If you don't find, if nobody finds it, you can never leave this room. <laughs> Just kidding. As someone always finds it, you guys, except for me. I never found it growing up. Not one stinking time. My sister, pretty much every year. Still bitter about it. Anyway, moving on. The child asks two more questions. Let's read those together. On all other nights, we eat vegetables and herbs of all kinds. Why on this night do we only eat bitter herbs? On all other nights, we are not required to dip the herbs once. Why on this night do we dip them twice? Okay, so those are some interesting questions, right? Well, we answer them with this. This is called a Seder plate. And when it's not Passover, we use it for deviled eggs. Just kidding. All right. You can tell from the picture on the screen, though, there's a piece of symbolic food that's placed in each one of the compartments on the Seder plate. And each piece helps tell more of the story of Passover. Passover is a story that we experience not just with our minds, not just with our words, but with our senses. God didn't just create us to be disembodied souls or spirits. He gave us bodies with which to worship him, right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So he knows if we're really going to remember something, if we're really going to work it down into our souls, into our guts, we have to experience it with our senses. That's what we're doing. So you're going to see... We are going to experience the story of redemption from slavery by first entering into the bitterness of slavery, okay? The first item on the Seder plate is called karpas, or greens. We usually use parsley, and we eat them. They represent life, but before we eat them, we dip them in salt water, which represents tears, so by dipping, we are reminded that a life without redemption, a life in slavery in Egypt, is a life that is immersed in tears, okay? So that is the karpas. The second item on the Seder plate is called the chazeret. Everyone want to try that one? Chazeret. Good. Thankfully, we don't eat this one, okay? <laughs> The chazeret is the root of a bitter herb, usually an onion or a horseradish root. And this is just symbolically there to remind us that the root of life itself for our ancestors in slavery in Egypt was very bitter. Next, we have the bitter herb itself, maror, freshly ground horseradish. Okay, So you're supposed to eat about a teaspoon or so of horseradish which I'm not going to do right now, okay? <laughs> and most of you know why, right? If I were to eat that much horseradish, I would not be able to finish this, okay? But that's actually the point. You're supposed to eat enough horseradish that you shed physical tears, okay? Which doesn't take that much, okay? So you shed physical tears to remind us of the bitterness of slavery in Egypt. Thankfully, the next item is much, much different. The next item is called charoset. Together? Charoset. Very good. Charoset is a delicious mixture, kind of like a chutney. It's made in Eastern uh, European Jewish communities of apples, 
honey, raisins, nuts, sweet wine. It's delicious. Other Jewish cultures, like from the Mediterranean, use dates or apricots or figs. Mm, one of my favorite things to eat at Passover. And it's a very sweet mixture coming right after that very bitter stuff. And the rabbis tell us that this is to remind us of the mortar that our ancestors used to make bricks for Pharaoh in Egypt. So you might be wondering, why is it so sweet then? Well, remember, we're moving from bitterness of slavery to the promise of redemption. So the rabbis tell us that it's sweet to remind us that the promise of redemption was just around the corner. Okay? So, remember, we set the stage for our celebration of the Passover with Jesus and his disciples at the Last Supper, which we said was a Passover Seder, but there has been some innovation. There's been some change in how Jewish people celebrate the Passover today. But we know that at least all of the things that we've, for the most part, walked through thus far would, would have been a part of Jesus and his disciples' Passover Seder as well. In fact, if you remember when it says, he who dips in the sop with me is the one who would betray me, right? So Jesus and Judas dip together in this very bitter stuff. That makes a lot of sense, right? But the last two items on every Seder plate in the Jewish community today were not part of Jesus and his disciples' Passover, and I think you'll see why as we go over them. The second to last item is called the Chagiga. Together? Chagiga. Good. You're getting a little better with the ch. Okay. We'll keep practicing though. The Chagiga or Beitza, these are the names given to the temple sacrifices in Jerusalem. Right? So you know there was a temple in Jerusalem. There was an altar within the temple where they performed sacrifices. Okay? So we roast the Chagiga, which turns it brown, just like the temple sacrifice. Then we break it, and we slice it, and we give it to each person, because it's a reminder of the destruction of that temple, which happened in 70 AD. Those of you who have been to a Jewish wedding before, and you know right before they yell, Mazel Tov, and he kisses the bride, he stomps on a glass. That's reminding us of the very same thing. The destruction of this temple that happened in 70 AD. So before we eat the egg, we dip it also in the salt water, which represents what? Tears. Tears. Very good. You guys are paying attention. It's great. So it's a token of grief over the destruction of that temple in Jerusalem. Likewise, the last item also reminds us of that temple, and it is called the zroa, which is the shank bone of a lamb. Passover is often called the feast of the Passover lamb, and yet in most Jewish homes today, lamb is no longer served as part of Passover. And this is because the lamb that used to be eaten as a part of the Passover was the one that was sacrificed in the temple, right? But what did we say? That temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So from that time to this day, no sacrifices have been made, and so we don't eat lamb at Passover. Instead, we have the, the chagiga, the egg, and the zroa, the shank bone, which should be on the screen behind me in just a second, the zroa to remind us of those sacrifices which are no longer offered. Now, the presence of these last two items on the Seder plate raises a very important question. It's a question that I wish more of my Jewish people were asking every year at Passover. And it is this, with no temple, with no altar, with no places for the sacrifice to be performed, how are we supposed to atone for our sins? Right? The law of Moses says really clearly in the book of Leviticus, in the Torah, Chapter 17, verse 11, he, God says, I have given you the altar to make atonement for your sins, for it is the blood by reason of life that makes atonement. All right? But with no place to do this, with the temple being destroyed, how is this possible today? Now, if you were to ask some Jewish person in your life living today that very question, their response would probably be, eh. <laughs> so what? 
So like blood and sacrifices and altars and nah, 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 all that stuff might have been important for our people like 2,000 years ago that has no bearing on my life today or how I celebrate the Passover, right? Not so much. I think we see why it is so important when we look at the very Haggadah that helps us celebrate the Passover, it says that each one of us is supposed to take the Passover so personally that it's as if each one of us were being brought out of bondage and slavery today. And I think that this reminds us of a very important truth. Not that each of us sitting here today needs to be redeemed from bondage and slavery physically, although that's still happening in the world, but for sure, each one of us does need to be redeemed from another type of bondage and slavery, and that is to sin, right? Jesus himself said, those who sin are what? Slaves to sin. So there's a type of spiritual slavery that affects us all, and you might not even be aware of it. So if we don't understand the severity of the problem, how can we understand the solution, right? And the solution did come about 2,000 years ago when there was once a man named Yochanan baptizing people in the Jordan River. We know him as John the Baptist, right? And one day he looked and he saw another Jewish man coming towards him, his cousin Yeshua, Jesus, and when he saw him, a light bulb went off in his head and he said, what? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is how redemption is possible, not through the blood of sacrifices offered year after year, as it says in the book of Hebrews, but the effective blood of the once and for all offering of the spotless Lamb of God. His blood was precious and effective to take away the sin for Jew and Gentile alike. So if you have put your faith in him this evening, then we as Jew and Gentile are one in him. Amen? All right, so we have a final question to ask that the child asks. Why don't we read that one together? It'll be on the screen. On all other nights, we eat sitting upright or reclining. Why on this night do we recline? So you see this pillow here? This is representing the fact that at Passover, we're supposed to eat this meal kind of like uh, relaxed and taking a load off because we remember that our ancestors who were in slavery in Egypt had to wait on their masters as their masters sat down for a meal. Likewise, they had to eat that first Passover in Egypt with what the scripture says, their sandals on their feet, their staves in their hands, and their belts fastened, ready to go at a moment's notice. They had to get out of there and be ready. But today, we're supposed to recline and relax. So that's what this pillow is about. And if you remember, in the New Testament, it says that when Jesus and his disciples were celebrating the Passover, they were doing what? Reclining at the table. This is what it was all about. And for those of us who have been redeemed from spiritual bondage and slavery, we can rest in that freedom today. So this brings us to the second of four cups. The second cup is called the cup of plagues, all right? So in Jewish tradition, a full cup represents complete joy, overflowing abundant joy. But for the second cup, we intentionally deplete our joy because we're reminded of the 10 plagues that fell on the land of Egypt because of the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. So we let 10 drops fall to our plate, one for each of the 10 plagues, because we're actually mourning their loss and expressing sorrow over our enemy's destruction because it wasn't anything that they had done to bring it upon themselves. It was the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. He was repeatedly told what God wanted him to do, let my people go, right? And he said, nope, not going to do it. I refuse. And because of this, the 10 plagues were brought not only onto his land, but also into his very own home as his firstborn son died because of the hardness of his own heart. So we mourn the loss of the Egyptians rather than celebrating the defeat of our enemies. 
But as I said, a Passover is a night of rejoicing, a night of thanksgiving, a night to praise God. And tonight, those of us who have placed our faith in Messiah Jesus as the Lamb of God can rejoice and give thanks that we have been redeemed from, phys- from spiritual bondage and slavery to sin. But sadly, most of my Jewish people around the world will not be celebrating that on Good Friday this year. That's the first night of Passover. So I want to pause because right now we would be traditionally breaking for the meal. There's like a big festive meal that happens right smack dab in the middle of the Passover, which I said we don't have tonight, but you can go out for dinner later. But I want to take just a couple moments to tell you a little bit more about the ministry of Jews for Jesus. Our mission statement is that we relentlessly pursue God's plan for the salvation of the Jewish people. And we relentlessly pursue it because we know that it is God's plan. His people are very close to his heart. They are the apple of his eye, as it says in the scripture. And our heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, just like the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, is that they might be saved. So, if you would like to connect with Jews for Jesus and hear more about Jewish people every day coming to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, being set free from spiritual bondage and slavery to sin, I would invite you to turn to this last part of your handout. You can fill it out as we speak, it's fine, and you can turn it in at the end. But I brought a short video just to show you a little bit about what we do with Jews for Jesus. But before that, I wanted to introduce you to my family. Uh, my family, it should be on the screen. Yeah. So. My wife, Shana, as I said, uh, we have three kids, Nora, Levy, and the baby's name is Itai. We live right here in Los Angeles. Well, not here, here, this is Orange County, but in Los Angeles, about a mile from UCLA, where our primary audience of Jewish people that we're trying to reach are Jewish students at UCLA, which in, back in the day, if you remember this, used to be called JuCLA because there were so many Jewish people that went there. It's still one of the most populous campuses of Jewish people in the entire LA area. And there are more Jewish people living in the greater LA area today than in the city of Jerusalem, if you can believe it or not. The world population, like metropolitan area, is New York City, Tel Aviv, Los Angeles, Jerusalem, okay? And there are more Israelis living outside of the land of Israel in Los Angeles than any other city around the world, okay? So we get to every day welcome Jewish people into our space in Los Angeles, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. Before I do that, I'm going to show you this quick video. So cue that up, please. Jesus seemed like he could be the Messiah, but I'm Jewish. The person said to me, have you ever heard of Jews for Jesus? As a Jewish person, when I started to follow Jesus, people would question if you're still Jewish, if you believe in Jesus. What I wish someone had told me when I first came to faith in Jesus is that I could have a thriving Jewish identity and a thriving faith in Jesus together and not have to choose between the two. The reality is, all of the first believers in Jesus were Jewish. They saw him as the promise of the Messiah. I want to invite you to join Jews for Jesus as we relentlessly pursue God's plan for the salvation of the Jewish people. Most Jewish people in the world have never heard the gospel, and together we get to change that. You make it possible for me as a missionary to engage with not yet believing Jewish people and to tell them that God loves them. And in a sense, it's not really us doing it, it's him doing it. We're just the ones who are carrying the message. Go and tell. That's what Jews for Jesus is best known for. It's that proclamation of the gospel out on the streets, meeting one-to-one. Come and see. And that is where we invite Jewish people to come into an environment, a community, a small group, a Bible study. And they can see the dynamic of a vibrant, community of Jewish believers in Jesus to love and serve. There's so many needs. And so we go out there lovingly feeding people, even as Jesus fed and met needs. And it opens people up to the gospel. Through your support, we can show Jewish people how beautiful God is, how beautiful Jesus is, and how beautiful the gospel is. 
every week around the world, Jews for Jesus welcomes new Jewish brothers and sisters into the family of Messiah. I'm so thankful for people like you who love the Jewish people and want them to see who Jesus is. If your heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, you're going to find yourself loving the same things that God loves. You're going to enter into His passion for His people. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that we've been waiting for. All that the Jewish prophets have talked about, all that God has spoken to us, every Jewish person deserves to hear the truth about Jesus. We found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Come and see. So one way that we are inviting Jewish people to come and see here, right here in Los Angeles, is through our cafe art space right across the street from UCLA called Upside Down. And this is a space that about 100 to 200 students come into every day that we're open. And it's for some of them the first time that any of them have heard Jews for Jesus at all. And we get to have that conversation with them over a great cup of coffee rather than in some kind of like hostile environment. So we do cafe hours every week. We do art shows. We do events like we're doing one tomorrow night on wisdom as the antidote to modern anxiety. If you know college students, you know that anxiety is one of the biggest struggles that they face in today's world. So we invite them to come and see that the answer to the struggles that they're facing is this ancient hope, this 2,000-year-old news of Jesus. So if that's exciting to you and you want to hear more stories of Jewish people coming to faith in Jesus, I would invite you just to partner with us. If you choose to give in any way today, you can do so either through the QR code that's going to be on the screen or I'm going to have a table out in the fellowship hall in the back where I'll be able to answer any questions that you might have about this subject, about Jewish evangelism or Jews for Jesus or Jewish culture and stuff like that. And I also have some free literature that you can grab from the table. This one is a great primer on how to share the gospel with Jewish people in your life. How many of you know Jewish person in your life, friend, neighbor, coworker, family member, even that's a lot of people, okay. How nice. How many of you would say that went really well? Yeah. God bless you. Just a couple people in the back. Yeah, it can be intimidating, but let me encourage you, okay? If God has done something in your life, then you have a story to share, okay? Uh, Jewish people may have a lot of objections to a Jewish person believing in in Jesus as the Messiah, but for you as a non-Jewish person who believes in the Messiah, oh, that's what you're supposed to do. Right? But if you build a relationship with a Jewish person, you j ask genuinely curious questions about them, about their experience of Jewish culture. How did you grow up celebrating the Passover? What does it mean to you? You get to know them and you tell them the story of what God has done in your life. You're gonna see God do some amazing things, but only through the power of prayer and his spirit does he bring somebody into the knowledge of his son, Jesus. It's not any special formula or anything. So we are dependent upon the prayers of people like yourself for this mission going forward, okay? So if you wanna know more about that, you can ask me about it later. You can sign up for our free newsletter. I have some copies of that. I also have some not so free things that I brought with me, um, including this book called Christ in the Passover. It's a great way to dig more into what we're talking about this evening. It has some more history about what was going on in the time of Jesus. I've got that with me as well as some other books. But as I said, that would have been like where we break for the meal. Not much of a meal, I know. But we are going to move into what is the focal point, the climax of the Passover Seder. And it is the third cup the cup of redemption, okay? But before we can proceed, something is missing, okay? Earlier, something was broken, buried, and now it needs to be brought back. Does anyone remember what it's called? Afikomen, very nice. Hand for Pastor Chris, everybody. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so if you're a kid and you weren't peeking earlier, now is the time where you can get up. Come on. Get up. Don't be shy. Yeah. 
Just, just one person? Are you kidding me? Come on. Let's go, guys. Come on over here. Here we go. That's what I'm talking about. So come up here, all right? Come up here. All right. Right there, right there, right there. All right. I'll give you a hint before we go to move this thing along. It is not, you ready? It is not on this side of the stage. Ready? Go. And it's not on this side of the stage. All right, we're getting warmer over there. Oh, now colder. Oh, somebody's getting warmer. Somebody's getting warmer. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. All right. What's your name, man? Caden. Caden. Congratulations. Yes. Now, if you come see me at the resource table in the back afterwards, I'll have a cash prize for you. Everybody give it up for Caden. Yes. All right. To all of you sad faces who walked away empty-handed, I'm sorry we're not all winners. It's okay. All right. However, you know, you have next year. You can do this again. I will never have another chance, and I never found it not once, okay? There's still time for you. Caden, you just did something I've never done in my life. You found the Afi Komen. Congratulate. <laughs> and I'm not even Jewish. Amazing. You'll have to tell me your secret, okay? All right. That was, um, that was awesome. Okay. So, the Afi Komen has been found. It's brought to the head of the household. It is removed from its linen pouch, and it is shown to everyone at the table. And we break off small pieces, about the size of an olive, and we take each piece along with the third cup, the cup of redemption. Does this look familiar? <laughs> it should, okay? This is the origin of communion, of the Lord's Supper. These very two elements of the Passover Seder are where Jesus described what he was going to do for us. And we're going to have an opportunity to do that together later. But before we do that, I want you to consider this with me. This afikomen, which was broken, buried, and brought back. And where did it come from? It came from this matzah tash, this strange pouch that contains three layers of unleavened bread. Now, there's a lot of debate in the Jewish community about what this pouch means. Some say that the three layers represent the three patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But why was the middle one broken, buried, and brought back? Others say it reminds us of the three divisions of worship in the ancient kingdom, the, the priests, the Levites, and the people of Israel. But why was the middle one broken, buried, and brought back? So the origin of this tradition within the Jewish community has been lost. There are even more explanations which I won't mention, but I think there is one explanation that suffices, and it's an ancient explanation that dates to about the first century. John tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. This one is removed while the other two remained hidden from our view. So those of us with the eyes of faith to see know that this threefold partition bears witness to another tri-unity and that of God himself. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the middle one was broken, buried, and brought back because Jesus himself was broken, buried, and brought back. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And the matzah, likewise, is both striped and pierced. Just as Jesus was pierced for our transgressions and by his stripes we are healed, and as the prophet Zechariah said, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and mourn as one mourns for an only son. When Jesus broke this piece, he gave thanks and said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat it, do it in remembrance of me, and we'll do that together in just a few moments. And likewise, he took the third cup the cup of redemption, the cup taken after the meal, it says in Scripture. And he gave thanks for it, and he raised it and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Now, Jesus was not inventing a new tradition there. He was talking about something Jeremiah had said hundreds of years before. Jeremiah said, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and Judah, not like the covenant I made when I brought them out of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them. But this is the covenant I will make with them in those days. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. And I will remember their sins no more. So the rabbis tell us that this broken piece of apikomen and this third cup, the cup of redemption, speak of the body and the blood of that Passover lamb whose body was broken and whose blood was shed to bring us out of bondage and slavery in Egypt. For those of us who have the eyes of faith to see, our Passover lamb is Jesus. His body was broken. He shed his blood to bring us out of bondage and slavery to our sin. And for those of us who have placed our faith in him this evening, we have something to celebrate. Amen? And that is what we do next. We move to the fourth and final cup, which is the cup of Hallel, or praise. Now, in Jewish tradition, we say, and in Christian tradition as well, we say hallelujah, which means praise the Lord, right? So cup of hallel means praise, and it's traditional to recite what is known as the great hallel in the Hebrew Bible. That's Psalms 113 through 118, which we're not going to do for sake of time. But remember, as Jesus and his disciples left that upper room, it says that they departed for the Mount of Olives singing hymns. These would have been the hymns that they were likely singing. And it ends with this pronouncement, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it just before Jesus goes to trial and is rejected by the leaders. Now, we're coming to the end of our time together, and there's one more cup, a cup that's sitting apart from the other ones, a cup from which nobody at the table drinks, and it is called the cup of Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Hanavi. In Jewish tradition, it's said that before the Messiah comes, he'll be preceded by the second coming of Elijah the prophet, the forerunner of the Messiah. In fact, it says in the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verse 5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So, the tradition is to fill the cup of Elijah, to send the youngest child to the front door, to open it wide and see if Elijah will be there to announce the Messiah's coming. Of course, he never comes, right? But when the cup is filled and the door is open, we sing a song together called Eliyahu Hanavi. And it's a very short song, so I'm going to sing it for you now, and then we'll close together. And I think it illustrates why, at Jews for Jesus, our hearts desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu Hatishbi, Eliyahu, Eliyahu, Eliyahu Agiladi, Bimhera Beyomenu. Yavo Elenu, Imashiach ben David, Imashiach ben David. And this means Elijah the prophet, Elijah the Tishbite, Elijah the Gileadite, may he come quickly in our days with Messiah, son of David. So you remember that my Jewish brothers and sisters will be singing this all around the world on Good Friday this year. And many of them, most of them, have not received this Messiah and have not recognized that this prophet has already come. Okay, Jesus said of the very man who declared him to be the Lamb of God, John the Baptist, he said, for those who care to receive it, he is Elijah who was to come. So the prophet has come, the forerunner of the Messiah, and so has the Messiah himself. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There is no other Messiah. And for those who have placed their faith in him tonight, we are one. Amen? Amen. And that is how we celebrate Christ in the Passover. 
Allow me to pray. Lord, our hearts belong to you, and so often they are calloused. So often we shut ourselves off from receiving the work that your spirit wants to do, but I pray that that would not be true this evening. I pray that we would respond. I pray that we would receive afresh this news, this ancient news that you've been telling since before the foundation of the world, this great plan that you had to save your people. And I pray that this evening our eyes would be open to see it in a new way. And as we move towards taking communion together, of partaking in these elements in a way that we're familiar with, that we do on a regular basis, I pray, Lord, that you would show us something new, that we would see them with new eyes, that we would be able to behold the Lamb of God together. I pray for anyone here this evening who has not yet placed their faith in the Lamb of God, that you would open the eyes of their heart right now to see that you are the sacrifice. You are the only way that atonement is possible, that a relationship with the Father, the Father who loves them, is possible. And for those of us who do believe, we confess it anew. We say, Jesus, come and do your work in our hearts by the Holy Spirit illuminate your word, illuminate these promises, these words that we're going to sing together now and help us to respond to the gospel. B'Shem Yeshua, in Jesus' name, amen. So we're gonna have an opportunity in just a few moments after these songs to respond. If you don't already have the elements for communion, they're outside, you can go get them. But we're gonna do it with hopefully fresh eyes together this evening. So I'll be right back. across the pages of time he who made every living thing behold him he who heard humanity's cry left his throne to wake as a child he became like the least of
Pastor Chris read for us earlier in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking to this Gentile church about the Passover, and he gets to the part where he's talking about the Lord's Supper, these very elements of the Passover that we just went over together. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. For you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But then he adds this part. He says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So if you haven't already, examine yourself and ask the Lord, is there anything within me right now that I need to confess to bring to you before I remember this great sacrifice that you did for me? Is there anything that I need to confess? Is there anything you'd like me to bring before you? And in his grace, the blood that Jesus shed washes that away. So let us peel back the first layer of these elements and take the bread together. (laughs) Let's eat of it together. It's the body of the Messiah that was broken for us and the blood of the precious Lamb of God shed for you. Let's receive it together. Lord, we confess that we are unworthy of your grace. That is why it's grace. And we receive it afresh tonight, Lord. We know that we have fallen short. We know that we are broken, but you were broken for us. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that we have been made new. We've been given new life. And now as we're going to celebrate in just a few days' time, as you were raised from the dead, we are now raised with you in new life. So Holy Spirit, fill us once again to experience that resurrection life that we have in you today. So, won't you stand with us as we conclude and sing this last song? Guys, why don't we give Isaac a a big round of applause? What a blessing. I I don't know about you, but what a beautiful depiction through that that entire dinner. What a beautiful, beautiful depiction of what the plan of salvation is for us, right? I mean, just so touching. So, well done, Isaac. Thank you so much for spending that time and and, and, and going through it so thoroughly and so beautifully. Uh, guys, we have uh, some, some snacks uh, prepared in the fellowship hall, so we're jealous for your time. Don't leave out of here too quickly. Go get your kids and come into the fellowship hall and join us and, and, and for a time of fellowship and togetherness, all right? So why don't we stand for this final song and hopefully see you in the fellowship hall and you can ask Isaac some questions. God bless you guys.